Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Life Church. Hey, you out there in the foyer, get in here. The clock said zero. That means it's time to go to church. Get in here. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited about what the Lord is doing. Hey, if you're a first time guest, welcome to Life Church. We are so excited that you're here. I'll be up on the platform here in just a second. And I want to tell you about an exciting gift that we have for you and then a connection card that we need you to fill out. For all of our Life Church family, I'm just thrilled that you're here this morning. We're excited for you. We pray for your health and your well being, and may the Lord bless you in everything that you're doing. I want to tell you about a quick couple of announcements, some, some things that you need to make note of. You don't want to miss some of these exciting events that are coming up. The first one I want to tell you about is our Hope for Life Restart. What is Hope for Life? Hope for Life is a non-residential program to help those that struggle with life controlling issues. Well, Pastor, I don't deal with drugs and alcohol. Well, not all life controlling issues are drug and alcohol related. How many Oreo cookies did you eat last night? How many episodes did you stream one after the other last night? <laughs> we all have life controlling issues. Some people deal with food. Some people struggle with drugs, alcohol. Some people have life controlling issues that are other people. Whatever your life controlling issue is, we want to help you find freedom in Christ Jesus. There is hope for you. So beginning on Thursday night, August the 11th at 6 p.m., our Hope for Life group is going to restart. We're going to be starting from scratch and we want to invite you. If you'd like to know more about finding freedom from your life controlling issues or how to help others that are struggling with life controlling issues, we want you to show up on Thursday night, August the 11th at 6 p.m. in our multi-purpose room. You won't want to miss this. We're excited that there is hope for life. The second thing I want to tell you about is to make sure that you've got your tickets for Endless Highway. You haven't got your ticket yet? What are you waiting on? You can go out to the welcome desk right after service and get your ticket or go to the church app and get your ticket. They're $10 a piece. Endless Highway is great. I I've known them for several years. They travel with Mark Lowry. They've been with the Gaithers. They're always on the top charts for Christian music. And they're going to be right here in Perry at Life Church on Saturday, August the 20th. Make sure that you get your ticket. There's limited tickets available. We want to fill this place up. So make sure that you, right after service or on your church app, get your ticket to Endless Highway and buy one for a friend, somebody that you really like. Buy one for somebody you don't really like. What a better way to get to like them and them to get to like you is by bringing them to Endless Highway on August 20th. I also want to tell you about our equip groups that are getting ready to start. Everybody say equip groups. Not all of you said it, but we'll get you there. Equip groups are something we've been planning. We've got a leadership team that's been meeting. We've been putting together some things. We've been praying. I've been telling you uh, since January that, that God's commission is all about discipleship. Our equip groups are discipleship groups that we're going to start in September. We're going to be unwrapping this and telling you more information in the weeks to come. But we need you to get excited. Get your expectations going. Don't sit there and start thinking, great, another service. You know, the old church, the Acts church, they met daily. We're asking you to put time aside Sunday nights specifically for discipleship. We need to know more about the Word of God so that we can teach others about the Word of God. The Bible says in Ephesians to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's what we're going to be doing. So we want you to start praying right now for equip groups that will begin in September. More information is coming. Men's group, don't forget, we're meeting tonight at 6 p.m. to continue our series, Play the Man. If you've not been coming, we want to invite you men. Go ahead and show up. It's not too late. We'll see you tonight in the multi-purpose room at 6 p.m. 
Again, Life Church, we're so glad that you're here. We love you, we appreciate you, and we look forward to what God's got planned today right here at Life Church. God bless you. Wow, no applause at all. Man. I'm just kidding. How many of you thought that was corny? Good, I need to see you after service. Who else? See, if we get some more people to start recording these things, you won't have to see me twice. Hallelujah. Hey, we're just trying to do something new, but seriously, we need some people to help us with our announcements. So if you want your moment in fame and you want to be on the camera, please make sure you see me. Seriously, we, we need some people to help us out. If you're a first-time guest, any first-time guest in the house this morning, anybody, first time here, don't be bashful. Raise your hand. Okay, all right, don't. We got a gift for you out there in the, the welcome desk. If you're a first-time guest, we've got a connection card we want you to fill out. And then if you'll take that connection card out to the information desk at the end of service, we've got a Life Church tumbler and a book that we want to give you. A couple of you are like, well, hey, I didn't get my tumbler when I was first here. Well, we're glad you're here nonetheless. But don't go out there and get your tumbler, okay? Hallelujah. Hey, we need people to help serve in our kids' ministry. Um, I, you know, I know that a lot of times you think, well, you know, maybe I'm too old or maybe, you know, that's just beyond. Listen, our kids' ministry, Pastor Jamie needs some help. So if, if you just pray about it, ask the Lord, hey, can I help out in some way? If it's just one Sunday a month, to help out, that, that would be terrific. To go back there, teach some lessons, help Pastor Jamie do some of the things she needs to do. We just really need some help. Uh, you can go out to the, the welcome desk and you can sign up or contact Pastor Jamie and just let her know, hey, I'd be willing to help you out one Sunday a month, two Sundays a month, whatever the case may be. And that would be a blessing to our children's church ministry, okay? Um, also, I want to tell you uh, about the Luke Fowler. We took up an offering last week to help uh, the Fowler family, Luke Fowler. Um, he's doing good. I've seen some videos, seen some pictures. Uh, he actually got him a part-time job while he was out there in Colorado. Never mind, that was a joke. Um, you didn't see the pictures. They, they had a picture of him at uh, Target bringing his stuff up. So uh, Aaron, his father, sent a, sent a picture, said we're supplementing our income. They got him a job. But anyways, cute young man. But they're doing good out in Colorado. Continue to pray for them. But we were able to give them a $2,000 check to help them with their expenses. Amen. <laughs> So I want to say thank you uh, for being a generous church. We've got a lot of things that we want to get done, things we're going to be talking to you about in the next coming weeks. Our equip groups are going to be starting. We've also got uh, some sound technicians that are going to be coming in to help us with our sound in the next couple of weeks. We're going to be talking to you more about those things. Miss Vicki claps, amen, praise the Lord, I'm with you. So uh, we, we've got some things going on, and we just need you to continue to give, continue to pray about what the Lord would have you to do. If you need an envelope this morning to help with your tithes and offerings, if you would, just lift your hand. Uh, Don will get you an envelope. Anybody need an envelope to give for your tithes and offerings this morning? Anybody at all? Anybody giving this morning? Uh, Randy, help me, man. All right. Hey, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12, it says, For if there is a willing mind, if there's a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what one doesn't have. See, God will not require more of us than what we can give, but God does look for people that are willing to give. You know, I think that's the problem so many times. I, I was talking to Don just a little bit ago. And so many times we, we get into this, hear me out now, don't, don't turn me off, it's too early in the service. Sometimes we get into this poverty, poverty mindset and a poverty mindset is not the fact that we don't have to give. The poverty mindset is that we just aren't willing to give what we have. We, we get things, we hold on to things, we're scared to let go of things. You know, people can become uh, uh, hoarders and they hold on to things. They don't ever need that stuff. They just don't want to ever let it go. And so we do that often with our income. And we need to be people that are willing to give. How many of you understand God is the one that supplies your income? God's the one that gave you the job. God's the one that takes care of everything that you have. And if you truly believe that, then we understand that God will multiply the seed that you sow. So make sure this morning when you come up during the first song and you give, give with a willing heart. Put it in there and just thank God. Thank you, God, for giving me my income so that I can give it back 
to the church so that we can see growth take place right here at Life Church. Amen. How many of you agree with that? Hey, how many of you noticed the, the shrubs when you came in this morning? Didn't they look good? Let me show you this picture real quick. Miss Olivia trimmed our hedges this past weekend. She said, I let mom help, but uh, pretty much she, she made the bushes look as good as they did. So we pre appreciate Miss Olivia and, uh, for doing what she did and letting her mom help her get our bushes looking good. Give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Amen. How many of you are ready to worship the Lord? Stand to your feet with us this morning. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Father, we just thank you for all that you're doing right here at Life Church. I thank you, Lord, that we can assemble together this morning to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, I pray right now, let each one that can lift up holy hands to a holy God. Let us uh, let our voices just be raised, Father God, to exclaim the goodness of our God. And Father, we just pray not only that we worship you in song, but Father, that we worship you in spirit, we worship you in our giving, we worship you, Father God, in our fellowship one with another. And we thank you, Father God, for what you're getting ready to do in us through us and with us. Have your way in this service, Lord. It's all about you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Lord, one thing, same God that never failed will not fail me. You won't fail me now in waiting. Same God who's never late, working all things now. You're working all things now. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes. When my heart is heavy all my days, oh yes I will. Yeah. I count on one thing, same God that never fails will not fail me. You won't fail me now in waiting. Same God who's never late, working all things now. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. choose to praise, to glorify, glorify, the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify, the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, oh yes, I will lift you high. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Oh, 
shadow that has ever overcome your life. There is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Show me one thing he can do. 
Show me mountain you can do. He's the God of the brave. Anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me water you can part. He's the God of the brave. Anything is possible. It's possible. Yes. Yes, Lord. Anything is possible. Isaiah says that Thank you. they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And as we sing this next song, just wait patiently before him. Just open your heart. Let his peace cover you the anxiety and worries of next week or today or whatever you're facing just fade away. Let him renew your renew your strength for today and for this week. the Lord of all creation, but still you know my heart, the author of salvation, you've loved us from the start.
and it's you we adore. Listen, I'm going to tell you, that's a sweet song. I love that. I ask her to do it again. If you need prayer for your body this morning, right now, I just believe the Spirit of the Lord just spoke to me. If you need healing in your body, come right now. We want to pray for you. She's going to sing that again. If you're waiting on the Lord to touch your body, now's the time.
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus, the King. What a beautiful name it is, the What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a What a beautiful name it is, beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ my Lord. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Name it is the name Jesus. What a power! No. 
nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Yet I'd hope. Silence the ghost of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. Death could, if you could not rival, you have no evil now and forever. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Would you just stay in an attitude of prayer and help me agree right now? We've, we've got many in our church family that are not here today that are struggling with sickness. And listen, God, can, God doesn't need me to touch them. God, God is well capable. <laughs> listen, when I'm touching you, it ain't me touching you, it's Him. But He can even go through Facebook. He can, he can go through. He's an omnipotent God. And we just want to pray right now. I want to pray for the Boswells right now that you be that God would touch Larry and Betty Boswell right where they're sitting. For Miss Fatima Leggett right now, that God would touch Miss Fatima right where she's at. That God would reach into to Miss Teresa, go right where she's at right now, and touch her right in her living room right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you that God is the healer. And Father, we thank you that you're moving. I pray that you touch these. Lord, there may be others, Lord God, that I have forgotten about, but I just pray right now. If there's any that are watching online, if there's any that are sitting there that need a touch in their body, we thank you, Lord, that your arm is not too short. Father, that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above. Lord God, that you are omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing. And Father, you're in all places. And Father, we thank you and we declare the power of our healer. And we declare right now, sickness has to flee in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it right now. Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. Give God a hand clap of praise. Come here, Miss Kathy. Come here, Miss Kathy. Come here, Miss Kathy. Yeah. Hallelujah. Keep going. Keep going. That's good. Hallelujah. Come here, Miss Kathy. Glory to God. I've been waiting for her for about a month now to come and she showed up this morning, so I'm going to put her on the spot. How many go ahead and have a seat if you want to. Glory to God. How many of you are here for camp meeting? Listen, I told you God, was, God moved during camp meeting. We had, uh, I think there was 12 decisions for Christ. We had four baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I told you there were two confirmed healings. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, April 23rd, when we are at Lake Jackson, we have this camp meeting. And for the whole next week, I had chest pain and shortness of breath. I have a home system that the doctor set up. But on Monday, my nurse called, and she says, Asked what was going on. I told her what was going on. I saw my doctor the next morning. The EKG it was abnormal. In fact, she says, I don't like this at all. She says, sent me to the cardiologist that night, that afternoon. And the next day, the 
created them. Ethel, and it's just Ted, which I didn't pass either. Um, and then the previous time, when I asked them about that, they told me I couldn't do anything. I had to be resting and go stretch. Um, on the 15th of June, of May, I think it was, when I, we came here, and um, I came up for prayer. And the rest of the day, God, he doesn't have to touch you for God to do a new and touch you. I knew before he got to me. You know, sometimes I think, well, if he, the pastor would just touch me, I know I'd be healed. But God touched me before he got to me. And <laughs> that, that whole list from then on, I uh, still had problems in the chest pain when the foot was addressed, but not the tumors like I'd been having. But I knew God was healing me. And we came to a family service on Tuesday night. Now, I had gone to my primary doctor because when we went that one visit for my cardiologist, I was frustrated because the church was mad. Um, <laughs> anyway, my primary, I went to my primary doctor on Monday. She said, I'm going to send you to a different church to get a referral, a different doctor. So we went to see this doctor on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we came here, and they had the tunnel of prayer. And um, I came through that. I had to come up for me. I had to come up for our daughter. I did not for another daughter we had who struggled with all kinds of problems. But when I come through that line and I got to the end and that young man that was helping with the praise and worship grabbed my hand and he started praying and I was saying, I hear his prayer. I have his prayer list. And then the minister that preached, his wife hugged me and she was crying and she was praying. And I have not since that time had any chest pain or shortness of breath. <laughs> Amen. Hey, listen, God is in the healing business. Don't you ever think for a second that God doesn't want to touch you. Hallelujah. Anybody else got a testimony? Anybody else? Hallelujah. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Anybody else got? Come on, Miss Noni. Well, go ahead. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Great job, worship team. Don't leave yet. Y'all can go ahead and take your stuff off. That's all right. Don't leave. Just don't leave the stage. Take your guitar off. Go ahead. It's okay. Listen, uh, I talked to Randy and the board um, back in September. Uh, Dr. Mark Merrill got my resume and he sent it down here. Uh, I've told you this, I never heard of Perry, Georgia. I got an email. He said, hey, Pastor, would you be willing to do a Zoom meeting? My wife and I did a Zoom meeting with them and, and uh, there were several of them in that, that room that day that we got to talk to. And uh, we had a great conversation. We started praying what would the Lord have us to do uh, about this church. And so um, from that point in September, uh, we went ahead and we started tuning in. Um, we were we were always preaching someplace, so I couldn't always watch them live. But I'd always go back and watch the services from Life Church, and uh, and just begin to pray, Lord, is this where you would have us to be? And uh, uh, Mike would get up and he would he would lead worship. And I remember talking. He was in he was in that room. He was in the Zoom meeting room the first time uh, we got to talk, and um, and then he would be up there leading worship. And uh, and I just as, the more I prayed, the more I prayed. And we just knew by the time we did the second Zoom meeting, we knew that this is where we were supposed to be. And uh, I remember when I got here and sitting down with the board and talking to them, and then, of course, Mike in January ended up getting voted onto the board. And uh, he said, now, Pastor, he said, listen. He said, when I signed up for this, Pastor Craig asked me to sign up for this. He said, I thought it was going to be a couple months. I didn't know it was going to end up being a year, now a year and a half adventure. But I'm going to tell you, he has been a blessing to this house. Amen. <laughs> and this is his last Sunday leading worship. Uh, Miss Susan's going to start leading until we find a, a worship pastor. But um, Mike has been a blessing. Come on up here, bro. Hallelujah. 
we just got Mike a, a little gift, something that I know he can use. Uh, I'll let him tell you a little bit more about it at some point uh, whenever he's ready. But he's, he's going to take his ministry outside the walls. He felt like that's where the Lord called him, and I agree with him 100%, and we're behind him 100%. So as a church body, we got together and, and we got him a, a gift through Sweetwater, which is where you buy a lot of sound equipment and stuff like that. So he can start uh, getting all of his things together. So he can start going into nursing homes, jails, street ministry, wherever the Lord begins to send him and put the gifts and talents that God's given him to work. And uh, we're just so grateful. He's not leaving the church. He's still on the board. He's going to be helping us with our sound, uh, helping keep me straight which is probably more than a full-time job than the worship was. And, uh, and, uh, but we're just, um, on this is his last Sunday to lead worship. We're just excited. We want to let him know how much we appreciate him. So would you stand back up to your feet? And worship team, would you gather around as we pray for him? And if everybody would, stretch your arms this way. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for Mike dying. We just pray right now that you'd reward him back his time, his efforts, and his gifts. Father, we just thank you and we praise you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Man, you ever just get one of those days, you just got so much going on in your mind, it's, uh, <laughs> did you say you got that going on a lot? <laughs> My wife will tell you, so do I, amen. All right. Hold on just a second. You know, I think so many times um, we get so programmed. Man, that bear with me. We get so programmed that um, man, it's got to be, it's got to be four songs. It's got to be whatever. You know, we we get programmed in our minds that the church has to be a certain way, and, and what we often forget is that church is not about the worship church is not about the preacher church is not about you amen bro that's good stuff pastor church is about him and man if we'll just get out of the way sometimes and he'll he'll move he'll move mightily uh i, I'm, I just listen there's always going to be a day to preach. There's always going to be a day to sing. But I just want to be in his presence. I'm just looking for a, a day. Uh, Eric was kidding around earlier, kind of. But I know his heart, you know. Uh, I, I'm waiting for the Shekinah glory of God to fall in this place. You know, where, where we just come in here and uh, it's just good. I believe if, if, if we would just understand this, and I said this earlier, and I, just, I really feel like I need to say it again. If, if we would just 
and I, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, so don't raise your hand, but, but if you could ever remember a time, does anybody remember a time, I just said don't raise your hand, so never mind, before televisions? How many of you, okay, how about this? Can you remember a time before everybody had a cell phone? Okay, see, now, other than that row right back there, most of us can remember that time. That row back there is like, oh my gosh, when was that? The Stone Age, all right? But, but I remember a time before cell phones. I remember traveling all over this country, being out on my motorcycle, not, not having a cell phone. Nowadays, people are like, oh, we gotta, what would we do? You know, there was, a, there, there was a time in that transition where cell phones first started coming out. And even from the time from when it went from flip phones to smartphones, their people were so, just so against the change. They were just so against the change. What do we need cell phones for? What, what do I need this smartphone that does all these things for? And we just resisted the change so much. How, how, how many of you would be honest and say, I was one of those that resisted the change, Pastor? Go ahead, lift your hand high. All right. And then, let me ask you this, now you've got one of those smartphones, and how much easier, how much better is life, right? I guess what I'm trying to get you to really understand is this, some of you need to quit bucking change. Now you can take that up with Jesus if you want to, but that's what I, I believe the Lord is saying, quit, quit trying to resist change. It's, it's not always going to be, be the way. I've said this so many times since I've been here. Eusta died. Who's Eusta, Pastor? We used to do this. We used to do that. It used to be this way. Eusta's gone. And I believe God's wanting to take us into a new season. And it's not always a comfortable season. It's not always the way you, you used to like it. But I believe that if we would let go and let God, it would be, it'd be better than the smartphone, trust me. We just, we just got to let go of the past. Amen? All right, I'll leave you alone with that. If you have your Bibles, you can go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Hallelujah. We've been talking for the last uh, several weeks about being filled to overflowing. Uh, we've talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit, we've been talking about being filled with, with Christ Jesus. Uh, we, we've been talking about just how we need to be filled to overflowing so that we can impact those around us, those that we work with, those in our family, uh, those out in the community. Listen, when we're filled to overflowing, when the Spirit of God and the presence of Christ is just flowing out of us, you'll just, you'll just bump into people and people will start asking questions. People just start wanting to know, what is this peace that I sense around you? What is this joy in the midst of chaos that's around you? What is this feeling that I sense when I get near you? I tell you all the time, man, I, 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 I want to be prayed up. I want to be close to the Holy Ghost. I, I want to I make sure that my life is always in order. I love getting on elevators with people and people just looking at me that I've never met. And they're like, who are you and what are you doing? Tell me about, you know. And they just start asking questions because they don't know. They just they, they, they want what you have. Listen, you're never going to draw people with a frown on your face. You're never going to draw people with a grumpy attitude. You're never going to draw people when you're always complaining. You're never going to draw people when everything in your life is sour. But when everything in your life lines up with God, when everything in your life is full of the Holy Ghost, when you understand that He'll take care of every problem and every need, people will just be attracted to you. Non-believers. Well, I don't believe about this Jesus stuff, but there's just something about you I just can't understand. We've got to be full. See, the goal of every born-again believer is to be different. The goal of every born-again believer is to be different. To be set apart. To not look, talk, or act like the world. But to look, talk, and act like the Lord. 
We looked at John chapter 3, verse 34, where he says, I do not give the Spirit by measure. Listen, he will give you to overflowing, pouring out rivers of living water flowing out of your innermost being. We can have him to the fullness. And not only being filled with the Holy Spirit, but being full with the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 1.23 tells us that His body is the church and we can have the fullness of Him who fills all in all. We should never feel alone. We should never feel powerless. We should never feel defeated. We're the church. Because we have received the fullness of God through Jesus, who is the Word of God that directs us, by the Spirit of God that fills us. If you would always get a hold of that, and I think that's something we even struggle with in the church. It's hard enough for unbelievers to understand this whole Trinity thing, but the problem is they struggle with it because I don't think the church fully gets it. Understand this, that that, that it's God who gave us the Word, which is His Son, which is Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Bible says the Word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And sometimes we just don't know the path, but thank God that we've got the Holy Spirit inside of us that is a better GPS than what you have in your car that will lead you along the path that you need to go. When we're operating in the fullness of God, we become vessels for purification. We are no longer filled with dirt and with sins of the world, but we are filled with the new wine, which is the Holy Spirit, which is able to equip us for service for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God desires us to be filled so that we can draw on His power and take His Word to others in service to the King. I Don't misunderstand this. I'm not... not, I'm not happy with the fact that Mike's not going to be leading worship. Mike has done a great job, but Mike will tell you that was not his calling. That was something he was willing to be obedient to when Pastor Craig asked, when God asked, because I'm pretty sure if you ask Mike, God told him to do it before Pastor Craig ever mentioned it to him. That's normally how it happens with me. God's already impressed it on my heart before anybody ever comes and asks me to do it. And he's been obedient to do what God, but that's not his gift and calling. Mike is filled to the full, to the overflowing, and he's wanting to take it outside the house to others that can't make it into the house. That's his gift. Some of you have gifts. Some of you, God has already spoke to you about some things. You just don't know how you could ever do it because you're not full to the overflow yet. God desires us to be filled. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. If you found it, would you stand to your feet this morning and let's read the Word of God. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. It says, Then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone desires to come after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. Father, we thank You again for Your Word that is truth, for Your Spirit that indwells us. We thank You, Lord God, for what You're getting ready to do in this place, what You've already done. We thank You, Father God, with expectation of what the Word of God is going to be revealed to us today. I pray, Lord, that You would speak through me clearly. Anoint me, Lord God, to do Your will. And Lord, be with each and every one that's in this house. And those that are watching online, give them ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And Father, we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Miss Sheridan and I were sitting in Jekyll Island back in February. And uh, we, we got to go to a minister's retreat when we first got here. And it was a great opportunity um, to... Uh, get to meet other ministers throughout the state it wasn't about vacation it was a little bit windy and a little bit cool that time so we want to go back to Jekyll Island now where we've been but it was great to get to meet other ministers and I remember the the second day that we got there 
uh, we went down that morning for breakfast, and we were sitting in a, in a hall, a big conference room, probably about the size of this room, and they had round tables everywhere. And uh, we got down there, and, and all these ministers, people that had been ministers uh, in the state of Georgia for years, you could tell they were all kind of grouped up by their sections and stuff. The southern Georgia group had over here, and the northern Georgia group was over here, and just had all these different ministers that were sitting. And we walk in, and we're the new people, and nobody knew who we were. And so we walked in, and, and uh, we couldn't really find a seat, so there was an empty table uh, up to the front, and we thought, well, we'll, we'll just sit here, and, and you know, we're trying to get to know people. So we sit down, and, and uh, then there was another missionary couple that sat down with us, and you got to hear him. They were, they were here back a few months ago, uh, missionaries to, uh, to Columbia. And so they sat down, we got to talking, and so it was just the, the four of us. And then all of a sudden, uh, the, the district superintendent, actually it wasn't even him, it was the guest speaker, it was the keynote speaker, he came over and he said, is this table taken? Is there room? I said, well, absolutely, sir. And so he sat down and his wife sat down, so the superintendent came walking in, he says, well, if my keynote speaker's sitting here, I guess I need to sit where my keynote speaker, so the district superintendent got to sit at our table. And so we're kind of sitting there, I'm thinking, you know, now everybody that didn't want to sit with us and didn't want to look at us because they didn't know who we were, now everybody's looking at us. <laughs> who are those people sitting over there with Dr. Mark Merrill and the keynote speaker? Who do they think they are, <laughs> you know? And so we're sitting there and we're eating our breakfast. And uh, Dr. Robert Crosby, he's an author, he's a minister, he's a counselor. He was sitting right next to me. His wife was there. And then, you know, Dr. Merrill and his wife and Miss Sheridan was sitting right here. So we're, we're just sitting there. We're eating our breakfast. And Dr. Crosby looked at me and says, uh, so where are you from? I said, well, currently, I said, I'm, I'm the new pastor at Life Church in Perry, Georgia. He said, oh, okay. So well, where did you come from? And so we begin to talk. And anybody that's been around here for the last seven, seven and a half, eight months understands this. I'm not very shy. So when he said, tell me a little bit about yourself, boy, I just, woof, man, I, I mean, I spun my chair around, forget the sausage and biscuits, and I just started talking to him. And he's just sitting there eating the whole time, just staring at me as he's eating. And it was like, kind of like Dr. Mark Merrill sitting over there going, you can shut up any time now, okay? But we just kept on talking, and, and uh, he said, man, he said, that is a powerful story. He said, how in the world do you go from Detroit to Tennessee, being a drug addict to being a minister, to running a drug program, to now being the senior pastor at a church in Perry, Georgia, that you didn't know nothing about? He said, how does that happen? And I looked at him, I said, I'm the one that Jesus loves. <laughs> His wife, her eyes got that big around. She just looked at me, and he starts cackling. I said, well, wasn't, wasn't that funny, doctor? He said, no, hang on a second. He gets up from the table. He runs to the back of the room, and he gets where his uh, display table, his book table is at, and he grabs a book, and he comes running back. He said, I didn't put this one up on the table. He said, because I actually only have one left. He said, but I want to give it to you. And it was a book that Dr. Crosby wrote called The One That Jesus Loves. And we just sat there, and we began to talk, and and so we got back, and uh, uh, as I've been reading this book, God birthed a desire in me several months ago about preaching on the fullness. God told me several months ago when I began to ask Him, why are we here? Why are we in Perry? Why are we at this church? What is our purpose for being here? And God has told me for months, even back in the very first phone call that we begin to have, he said, our calling in ministry is to make disciples. That's what, that's what we're all about, is to make disciples. See, I once was lost and undone, but somebody told me about Jesus. Somebody walked with me, and somebody taught me the Word of God. He created a hunger in my heart for the Word that I just can't help, but I want to give out to others. I want to walk with others. I want to teach others. And I want others to walk so that they can teach others so it can go on and on and on and on. The reason in September we're starting equip groups is not to have you come for another service, not for me to preach another service, because I won't be preaching on those nights. It's an opportunity for us to do discipleship the way discipleship is supposed to be done. 
If you think for a second this is all you need, that would explain probably some of the things going on in some of your all's lives. An average church, we can talk about any church, you can pull out any, I was reading a study this past week. Assembly of God churches, over 50% of Assembly of God churches in the United States are churches of, le- of 250 or less. Okay? I, th- I think it was actually somewhere around the 70% mark. Over 70% of Assembly of God churches in the United States are churches of less than 250 people. 36% of those churches are churches that are less than probably 150. And so it was talking about church growth. And what's happened with so many churches is so many churches have gotten so large that it's hard for them to do discipleship. We've gotten rid of Sunday school. They've gotten rid of Sunday night services. And there's a lot of churches that have even gotten rid of Wednesday night services. All they have is they have about an hour to an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. And for most people, if you talk to them at 5 o'clock in the evening and you ask them what the preacher preached on at 10 o'clock that morning, they couldn't tell you. And we wonder why we have weak churches. Weak Christians. Because we don't have strong disciples. In order to be a disciple and make disciples, we need to listen to the call of Christ. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. Church, Jesus is calling. Jesus is calling. Many hear Him, but not many are listening. Many hear something. Many are, are, are hearing things going on. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, there are many voices in the world and none without significance. But the problem is, what voice are you listening to? You hear a lot. You hear a lot on CNN. You hear a lot on Fox News. You hear a lot on commercials. You hear a lot on the television shows you watch. You hear a lot at the places you work. The question is, what are you listening to? Are you listening to the Word of God and what God has to say to you? And is it ranking higher than what everybody else is saying? Or are you just hearing a message on Sunday morning and not doing anything else with it during, out, during the rest of the week. I bought journals when we first got here. That was my, my wife and I's gift when we first got here. We bought journals to hand out to people. Because in order to be a good disciple, you've got to take some notes. Because in order to remember what I say at 10.30 this morning, and remember it at 5 o'clock, you've got to write it. When you begin to put all facets into practice at the same time you're hearing, you're seeing, and you're writing, you'll begin to remember. But if all you're doing is sitting and staring, you're probably not absorbing. Everybody puts their arms down. (laughs) I believe the reason many are not being filled to the fullness of the Holy Spirit or walking in the fullness of Christ is because they are not listening to what Jesus is calling them to. So in his book, the one that Jesus loves, Dr. Crosby mentioned four things. And as I read this book uh, several months ago, it began to stir in my heart, and I began to study out these four things. And God gave me a greater revelation of what it was. When, when, when Dr. Uh, Crosby, and I'd love to order a bunch of these books, and I may try to see if I can get a case. And when Dr. Crosby, he mentions them real quickly, and he gives just a couple. And, and it stirred my heart so much that I began to study them out. And as I began to study them out, I, I, I started noticing that I had pages and pages and pages of notes that I kept taking from a chapter that was only five pages long. I've already got over 20 pages of notes off of something in his book that just gripped me so much. 
And I begin to weep and I begin to cry out to God. Lord, show me what it is you're trying to tell me. Because this is the deal. Dr. Crosby wrote something in a book that I read and I heard what it said, but then I listened to what the Holy Spirit said. If we would listen to God, we would know what He is calling us to is greater life. See, the first thing that God is calling us to is greater intimacy. Greater intimacy. Matthew 16, 24 says, if anyone desires to come after Me, if anyone desires, how many are truly desiring to go after Christ. I think there are some that are desiring heaven and not hell. There are many desiring to be noticed or recognized. There are many that are desiring to have lots of friends in this world. But how many are truly desiring to follow Christ? If you remember, Jesus, there were 5,000 men plus women and children that followed Jesus to a field on the side of a mountain and they were all about getting the loaves and the fish. But when He started talking about picking up crosses, it dwindled down. And then from there, He began to talk about eating his body and drinking his blood, and it dwindled down. And then he began to talk about the fact that he was going to have to be crucified and that he was going to have to leave them, and then it dwindled down. And it kept on dwindling and dwindling. Because not everybody truly desires to come after him. The purpose of life is to pursue and to live in an intimate relationship with God. Dr. David Kyle Foster said this. Listen to this. I don't know if I've got this up there or not. Dr. David Kyle Foster said, Salvation is our rescue from the sentence of death because of sin. But intimacy with God defines our life with Him. Let me say that again. Salvation is our rescue from the sentence of death because of sin, but intimacy with God defines our life with Him. The definition of intimacy is close familiarity or friendship. Closeness. A close familiarity means you are so close that you know what the other likes and dislikes. What brings the other pleasure or displeasure? God desires us to have a closer familiarity with Him. When I I think about this familiarity, when I think about this, this closeness that God is calling us to and this desire to be intimate with Him, I think about my relationship with my wife. I've made this statement before. We've been married 26 years now. But I think about what if on June 22nd of 1996, standing on the side of a mountain, saying our vows, as soon as we got done and we put the rings on and the minister said, I now pronounce you man and wife, if I looked at her and said, thank you very much, I'll talk to you later, and I jumped in my car and I took off. And five years later, I showed up at her house and I knocked on the door and she answered the door and I said, hey babe, uh, my key's not working, let me in. And she would look at me like, you got to be out of your mind. Well, come on, we got married and, and so we, you know, let, let me in the house. Listen, I haven't talked to you in five years. And you want to come in here and get Intimate? right but see we do that with God we do all we want to do we go where we want to go we live the life we want to live we want to have all the fun do all these other things and then when everything all heck breaks loose in our life God 
Bail me out. Who are you? I don't know who you are. No, no, no. Remember, God, remember that time. I, I used to go to that church over there. I know I've been a little spotty, but it's summertime. I know my attendance hasn't been what it used to be, but you know I've had a lot going on. Somebody said I always preach to the right, so let me preach to the left a little bit. <laughs> you know, we, we, we do all these things, and then all of a sudden something tragic happens in our life, and we start asking God, where are you at? Why can't you help me? What's going on? Why did I get this report from the doctor? Why don't I have money in the bank? Why is all this happening to me? Get me out of it, God. And he's looking at us saying, I don't even know who you are. See, not only am I familiar with my wife and close to my wife, I'm close to my God. I spend time every day in the presence of my Lord. I pray without ceasing. I'm in my Word every single morning. I'm studying throughout the day. My wife and I pray together. I journal we spend time throughout the year fasting and praying. I want to be close to God. I want to know my God better than I know my wife. I've been praying. My daughter's 24 years old and my son is 23. And I've been praying ever since before they were born that God would send them a spouse that's full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, on fire for God, that loves Jesus more than they love my kids. Because if they love Jesus more than they love my kids, then I know that the way that they're going to treat my kids is going to be satisfactory for me. But if they love their lives better than they love my kids, they're going to have an issue with daddy-in-law. God desires us to have a closer familiarity with Him. We should desire greater familiarity with our Lord, our Savior, our Deliverer, our Redeemer. Jesus said, Jesus said, if you desire, if anyone desires. This word desire means to hunger. To hunger. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger for intimacy with God. Blessed are those that hunger for more knowledge of my word. Blessed are those that hunger for more intimacy with me. Blessed are those that hunger to be in my presence. Blessed are those that want to be part of my body. Because if they hunger, they shall be filled. But if you're not hungering, you're never going to be filled. You're never going to get to that place. See, some people don't fast because fasting is uncomfortable. Some people don't fast because they're worried about the hunger pains. Some people try to create, we, we were in a church and, and they started coming up with all kinds of crazy fasts. And, and don't disagree, I'm not trying to, I'm going to get myself in trouble here in a second. There's nothing wrong with fasting television. There's nothing wrong with fasting Twinkies. There's nothing wrong with, with fasting whatever, okay? There, there's all kinds of things. But if you begin to look, and we'll teach on this hopefully maybe in November or December. <laughs> Not November because Thanksgiving, but in December. Maybe we'll teach a little bit on fasting so we can get ready to fast in January. But anywhere you read in the Bible where it talks about fasting, it means to close mouth. It has nothing to do with your hobbies or, or none of that stuff. It has to do with food. Fasting wasn't created to be comfortable. Fasting wasn't created to make you like it. Fasting was created so that you would die to your flesh. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. You'll be filled with what you hunger for. You'll be filled with what you hunger for. If you hunger for more of the world, you'll be filled with it. If you hunger for more sin, you'll be filled with sin. But if you hunger for more intimacy with God and more of His righteousness, He will fill you with that. Greater intimacy. Greater intimacy requires three things. And, and, and forgive me, we're just not going to get that far today. 
Um, I was hoping to get a lot farther. But greater intimacy requires three things. The first thing the greater intimacy requires is genuine repentance. Genuine repentance. I've heard people say that repentance is just turning from uh, uh, one's wicked ways. I think repentance is more than just turning the other way. There must be transformation in the turn. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If, if you're going this way and you're sinning and you just turn this way and there's no transformation, you're going to keep on sinning. I had a sin problem, a drug problem, an alcohol problem in Detroit. And I thought if I could just get out of Detroit, I'd get rid of my problems. And then I got to Cookville, Tennessee, and I found out something. There's drugs and alcohol and sin in Cookville, Tennessee. The problem wasn't the drugs, the alcohol, and the sin. The problem was the guy in the mirror. You can run, but you can't hide unless you change. There's got to be transformation. In the Greek, the word repent is made up of two words. The first word denotes change of place or condition. The second word means to exercise the mind to think and comprehend. So we need to change our place and our condition. Then we need to exercise our mind so that we can think and comprehend. When combined together, these two words indicate genuine change has taken place. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Die to self. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world. Man, that one right there. I'm telling you. That needs to be painted on the side of the wall. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, we realize we cannot go willfully, go on willfully rather, disobeying the one we love and still maintain intimacy. I can't, I can't continue to, to lie to my wife, cheat on my wife, talk ill to my wife, treat my wife terrible, not spend any time with my wife, and plan on having any intimacy. Everything in the Bible, every time you talk about relationship with God, He always goes back to marriage. He is the bridegroom. We are the bride. As the bride, if we keep treating the bridegroom ill and not paying any attention to Him, we're never going to be intimate with Him. We, we, we need to realize that there needs to be a change of mind and a change of actions if we want to see intimacy between us and God. So how do you genuinely repent? The first thing is you need to die to self. Choose to be a living sacrifice. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. A living sacrifice to God is one who does not conform, but is transformed. The old man must die before the new man can live. Used to has to be done so that we can move forward. Secondly, you have to renew your mind. You have to die to self, then you have to renew your mind. The mind is the key to the Christian life. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The reason why non-Christians don't respond to biblical truth is they can't discern truth. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can we know them because they are spiritually discerned. Why do we need to be disciples? So that we can rightly divide. So that we can understand. So that we can receive it. So we're not foolish. Foolish. Many sit in churches on Sunday morning and, and, and what the preacher says goes right over their head. It's because we're, we're not making good disciples. 
We're not breaking down the Word. That's what we're doing on Wednesday nights with Romans is we're breaking down the Word. On, on Sunday nights when we get into our equip groups, we're, that's what we're going to be doing. Is we're going to be breaking it down so that you can understand. So that you can make sense of it. So that you can be a better, so that you can transform your mind. Genuine repentance means you die to self and you renew your mind. And number three, you must submit to God's will. You must submit to God's will. Many of us are living doing our will. If we have died to self, renewed our mind, then God's will should be lived in our life. He goes on and he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Has anybody ever heard that old saying, the proof is in the pudding? You ever just tasted some pudding that wasn't very good? The proof is whoever made it didn't know what they were doing. Right? I've heard people say before, oh, I'm a good cook. And I've ate some of their food. I'm like, you ain't proving it. <clears throat> right? So he says, prove. Prove that you died to self. Prove that you've been transformed by the renewing in your mind. How do we prove? The word prove is a Greek word that means to recognize as genuine after examination. Recognize as genuine after examination. Genuine repentance involves crying out to God with sincerity of heart, agreeing with Him that what He did was wrong. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. It says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. We need to genuinely repent. If you genuinely repent, if you truly die to self, if you truly renew your mind, and if you truly begin to walk it out and submit to God's will, people that are around you will notice. I told you last week about all those that worked with me in the car business. They saw the change. The proof was in the pudding. It wasn't just my words. It wasn't my Christianese t-shirts or the fish on my bumper. It was the way that I was living. It was the way that I was talking. People will know that you have intimacy with God when you genuinely repent and are not living the way that you used to live. We may have to turn off cable. You may have to find a new radio station. You may just have to find some new people to hang out with. Bad company corrupts good moral character. You can't keep running with the chickens if you want to soar with the eagles. There needs to be transformation. Now I didn't get as far as I wanted to, but this is the, the, the whole thing. is I want us to get to a place of greater intimacy with God. I want us to get to a place where we're not only hearing His voice, but we're listening. We're listening to what He's saying. We're listening to the call of God in our lives. And I'm going to tell you this. The most intimate thing that we can do on this side of heaven is in communion. In communion, we remember the body and the blood. In communion, we partake of the Lord's death till He comes. If you did not get a communion cup and you need one, if you would, just lift your hands. The ushers will make sure that you get one. Does anybody need a communion cup? Got one here. A couple back over there. You guys got one? I need a couple up here, Don, please. I told him I wanted to get one of those guns and start shooting the communion cups out. I need two, three. Thank you, sir. Oh, I'll let you go ahead and open them before you start playing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody else need one that does not have one? So listen, the only requirement of taking Holy Communion is not whether you're a member of Life Church. It's not whether you're a um, 
Pentecostal or not Pentecostal, the only requirement of taking Holy Communion is that you be born again. Salvation and repentance. So if everyone would, if you'd close your eyes, bow your head. Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says that we need to take in a worthy manner. If anyone does not take in a worthy manner, that's why many among you are sick. Many of you die. And what he's talking about is a spiritual death. Because we're not taking communion right. And to take communion right means that you're right with God. So I'm going to ask you this morning, first and foremost, if you're in this place this morning and you're not right with God, you say, Pastor Tim, if, if I die today, I don't know that I'd go to heaven. I don't, I don't know, Pastor Tim, right now that if, if something were to happen and Jesus were to come back, that I'm, I'm where I need to be. I want to be saved. If that's you and you're in this place and you say, Pastor, I, I, I need to be saved. I'm not where I need to be. I want to be born again. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? Anybody in this place? You say, I just need to be born again. I want to be right with God. Maybe you say, Pastor Tim, I've been saved. I've been born again. I've confessed Jesus as my Lord, but I've not always lived the way that I need to. And, and I just need to repent of some things right now. I want to make sure that my heart's pure. I'm examining my heart and I don't like what I see, so... I need to repent. And if that's you, would you just lift your hand? Anybody in here? I see that. Anybody else? I see that. Anyone else? You say, I'm not where I need to be, Pastor. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask each and every one of you, if you would, just repeat after me this morning. So, Heavenly Father, I ask you today to come into my heart to be Lord of my life. I believe in one God. And I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He came for me. That He died for me. That He rose for me. And I ask you today that you'd cleanse me with the precious blood of Jesus and make me whole. And I believe by my confession and faith that I'm born again and that I'm right with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, so you're born again. Apostle Paul said on the night that Jesus was betrayed, sitting in that upper room, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. We want to be intimate with God. Familiarity. Listening to Him. Hearing His voice. And listening to what He's saying. Can you give thanks for His precious body this morning? Father, we thank You for the body of Jesus. Him who knew no sin that became sin for us. His body that was broken and bruised and nailed to a cross so that we did not have to. Father, I thank You that as we do this intimately, remembering Your death, Father, it brings to us life and life more abundant. We thank You, Lord, in Jesus' name. Break and eat. Then He took the cup, which was the new wine. The fullness of Him who fills all in all. And He handed them the cup. And He said, this is My blood shed for you to cleanse you from all sin, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, to wash away every spot. When we partake of His blood, we're doing it in remembrance of Him. Knowing that His blood was shed in our place so that we don't have to. Would you lift up your cup? Father, we thank You for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us and makes us whole. Thank You for the blood of the Lamb 
Thank you, Father God, that we are new creatures in Christ. Thank you, Father God, without spot and wrinkle, in the presence of our God, we do this intimately. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake. Father, I thank You again for this opportunity to be with brothers and sisters in Christ as we partake of Holy Communion. The greatest desire of our Lord is intimacy. Lord, that's why You came down and You walked with Adam in the cool of the day and had fellowship with him. That's why You came down and You You talked to Abraham and you told Abraham about what was getting ready to happen in Sodom and Gomorrah because you were intimate with Abraham. That's why you met Moses on the mountain because you were intimate with Moses. That's why you came down and you began to speak through and to your prophets because they heard your voice and they listened to what you said and they shared it with others because they were intimate. That's why you sent your son to make disciples, that those disciples would make disciples, and so on and so forth, that we would be intimate with You. Father, we thank You for that intimacy. We thank You for Your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand to your feet? Let's just sing this song right before we dismiss, please. Waiting here for you with our hands lifted high. Yeah, come on, lift up your hands if you can. Acknowledge him, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Begin to thank God for all that he's done in your life, for who he is. Are you waiting on Him? Don't wait on the restaurant. Don't wait on the clock. Don't wait on what is next. Let's wait on Him this morning. Let's seek His face this morning. Listen, if you need to come to the altar, the altars are always open. If you need to pray, let's just, let's just give glory to the King of Kings. We adore. Father, we thank You. We thank You that You've been waiting here on us. Father, before we ever got here this morning, before I got here at 7.30, Lord, You were here. As I came into the sanctuary and as I began to pray, Lord, I felt Your presence. Lord, as people begin to show up and as this room begin to fill up, Lord, I believe the Lord was glad. Father, I could... 
I can hear you, Lord, as you desire your people. As you desire your people to draw close to you, as you desire your people to call out to you, as you desire your people to receive from you. Father, we love you. Lord, help us this week to draw even more close, to be intimate with you. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that you first loved us. We thank you, Lord, that each and every one that's in this room this morning can say, we are the ones that Jesus loves. Father, we give you praise for it. We thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We see you Wednesday night. Men, we got Bible study tonight.